On New Year's Day, 1981, I opened my heart and asked Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. I had just heard a Jewish woman who was a judge tell the amazing story of how she had found Jesus. After that time, I went through Bible school and discipleship training school, and God began to call me to do things for Him, things that I considered impossible. Organize a march for Jesus in a large city where I was new and where few people knew me? But I found that the only name that was needed to draw people was Jesus. And I began to watch God do the impossible as I would take little steps of obedience to Him. Most of the time, I encountered no problems with the fact that I was a woman. God repeatedly showed me ways to do things, such as having a respected team of pastors as an advisory board. During this time, I began to study the scriptures about women in ministry. I found it fascinating, especially the groundbreaking research, uh, in particular in the last two decades that's been done by Bible scholars into this topic, looking at the actual Greek words used in the relevant scriptures, looking at the cultural context, and looking at scripture as a whole on this topic. Well, I'm an organizer, and I felt God leading me to put all the relevant scriptures on one piece of paper. I never dreamed in my wildest dreams that it would end up as this full-color map for gender reconciliation that would go around the world. I thought it was just my own study. But here it is, and God's amazing us yet again. So uh, we want to begin our study, and as an overview, on side one, we have information about the need for gender reconciliation, a timeline of the history of women in the church, which I understand that this is the first time that that's ever been done. Uh, we'll review elements of reconciliation and some scriptures at the very end. And then on side two of the map, which folds out like a road map, so it's handy, you can fold it up. We have scriptures, and uh, over, over 50 scriptures about women in ministry. And we're going to go through this. It's like a, like a power tool. We're going we're gonna to rock through those scriptures. And uh, you're gonna, when we get done, you're going to have an overview of this. So fasten your seatbelts. Then when we get done, there are many books. If you want to continue your study, there's some listed on the map and, and recommended. I myself read over 100. So there's a lot of more study you can do, but you're getting the overview today. As we study the controversial scriptures that sometimes uh, are used to limit women, I'm certainly not going to tell you what to believe. That's not my place. But what God has called me to do is to provide and consolidate a tool of the respected Bible scholars' theories and information that they have provided for us. And then I'm going to leave it to you to study, to pray, and see how God would lead you in ways that are pleasing to Him. So let's just pray briefly, and then we'll begin. Father, we do ask for you to be with us this morning through your precious Holy Spirit. We thank you for the blood of Jesus, and we thank you for the Spirit of truth. Come now, Holy Spirit, and please guide us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know that approximately one-fourth of the world's women are violently abused in their own homes? The U.S. government reports the same statistic for the U.S. Domestic violence in the U.S., in fact, is the biggest cause of injury to women. Seventy percent of the world's poor are women. A girl in the world is twice, twice as likely to be uneducated as a boy. In multiple countries, women and girls are fed after the men, and they don't get the same nutritious food. Two million girls, mostly in Africa and the Middle East, are mutilated annually through female genital circumcision, which is required in that culture for a girl to be acceptable and can result in infection and death and lifelong pain. In India, more than 5,000 brides are burned to death, and this is considered a conservative figure. My friends that I met uh, from India at the Lausanne Conference tell me it, at least 5,000 women a year burned to death each year so that the husband can seek another bride and the dowry, which is the custom in India where the bride's family gives the husband gifts when he marries the bride. So he gets rid of the first husband, and get, or first wife, and gets another wife with more gifts, a terrible problem. In numerous countries, female babies just disappear. And especially in Asia and in some problems, the country is severe, the problem is severe. As many as four million women and children are sold each year 
for the sex trade or to work as slaves. In Thailand, young girls are kept in brothels, often until they die, and often from AIDS. And I, it broke my heart when I was in Thailand for the Lausanne Conference, and we drove by the red light district, and you could see the little girls. In the U.S., one-third of all sexual assault victims are under the age of 12, to our great shame. One in six women, and at least one in 33 men has, an experienced, uh, has experienced an attempted or completed rape. And those, we are told, are conservative figures. Well, let's take a look at the church. And what gender issues do we have in the church? We certainly see the need is terrible in the world. And we as Christians are called to address that injustice, aren't we? But in the church, we're not immune to the problems of domestic violence, sexual abuse, or divorce. And sometimes scripture is misused to justify ungodly behavior. Various Christian churches hold different opinions on the levels of leadership women may hold based on different interpretations of scripture, which we'll look at in just a little bit on side two. And sometimes gifted and mature women feel disenfranchised. They feel left out. Where, where can I be used? Where can my gifts be used for God? Many women, especially professional women, and I have met some of these um, in the work that I have done, have turned away from the church or will have nothing to do with it due to the treatment of women by some churches. They don't want to be, as they think of it, second-class citizens. So we need to do a better job as the church, and um, some churches are certainly doing a wonderful job, and, and I think... We, each of us before God need to do uh, what we feel God is calling us, but we do need to study the scriptures and take a look at what scholars are saying to us now and not just fall back into our cultural beliefs on this. Uh, my husband was talking to a well-educated man um, uh, about a year ago, a sophisticated man, and he said to him, how can you be a Christian with the way Jesus treated women? And that's his understanding of the church. Now, that couldn't be farther than the truth, as we'll study, uh, because Jesus treated women in revolutionary ways for his culture. But that's often the perception of the world. And so we need to change that perception, and we as a church need to take a look at, at what we are doing. Now let's look at the history of women in the church. I asked the Lord, Lord, how did we get here? How did we get to this situation uh, with gender situation we have? Well, what happened? What happened throughout the ages? And God began to direct me, uh, I sensed, to, to make a timeline. And I'm, I'm told this is the first time this has been done, of a timeline of the history of women in the church. And we'll see the light and the dark spots, just like we do in the history of mankind. So if we look at uh, first of all, the creation, creation and the fall. We see that God creates male and female in his image, Scripture tells us. And the original words for female imply equality and the kind of help God gives. I'll just go to the road map here. God tells them, Scripture says in the plural, to rule over the earth. Then both sin and God prophesies of Jesus and also, that there will be a battle between Satan and the woman, because Jesus will come through the woman. And we've seen that battle throughout ages. God is a true prophet, isn't he? Then we see uh, in the Old Testament time, Miriam and Deborah are leaders called prophets in Scripture. We have women prophets Huldah, Isaiah's wife, and Joel prophesies that women and men will prophesy. Then we have, and this was what was so helpful me, to me to understand, a 400-year interval between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is called the days of mingling. And this is because the Jews were living among the Greeks, the Romans, as the Roman was, Romans were conquering the big Roman Empire. And on average, there would be about a 20% population of Jews among a larger general population. So you see they're mingling, and they call it the days of mingling. So we see, for the first time in Jewish writings, some of the thoughts from the Greek thought. Um, there was quite a, quite a disdain and oppression of women. The Romans were somewhat better, but uh, the Greek thought, and the Greek thought was considered 
uh, the elite. They were the premier thinkers at the time. So this was permeating throughout. So we see a sense of inferiority and servility placed on women during this time. And in the synagogue, women could not speak. Um, uh, or in public, they weren't supposed to speak out. Uh, Jewish women we're talking about. Or study scriptures as men did. So we came a long way from Deborah and Huldah and Miriam, didn't we? Now into this time, Jesus was born. And he treated women in revolutionary ways, as scholars have said. He shows them respect and includes them in ways that are unheard of in his culture. We'll look at that more in a bit. And he commissions women first to say that he is risen. In the New Covenant, we have the blood of Jesus with baptism as the, as the sign of the believer, which is gender inclusive rather than circumcision, which certainly is not. Then we have Pentecost. The Holy Spirit fills 120 men and women on Pentecost who all prophesy in the streets. And Peter says it is Joel's prophecy regarding men and women prophesying. Then we look at Paul, and Paul makes the revolutionary statement that there's neither male nor female in Christ Jesus coming against the culture of the day when women were really inferior. This was dramatic. He calls women co-workers in a time when they weren't even supposed to study scripture, and they're co-workers for the Lord. He mentions house churches that meet in their homes, and in that time, if the house church met in your home, you were the leader. It's not like now, like it is now where you can have a host and then you have the teacher that comes in. Comes in. If it was in your home, you were the leader in that culture. He praises women. He calls for men to serve their wives, which was absolutely unheard of. If we look at uh, Scripture itself, in the New Testament, we have 124 references to women in the Gospel, uh, the four Gospels, and 33 in the Book of Acts. In a time... In the literature that day, rarely mentioned women, if at all, um, and, and certainly rarely positively. Study the Greek literature of the day. You don't see many women, do you? So in the culture of this day, this is dramatic that we're seeing women included even in the literature, in the written word of the, of the, the Scripture. And we have 886 verses spoken by women in Scripture. So, uh, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, and Scripture tells us that all Scripture is given for teaching. All is profitable. So, in Scripture, we hear from women. We have churches that meet in homes, and then including homes of women, and then we have Christians are persecuted, and they scatter. Then, in A.D. 107, about 70 years after Jesus' death, a man named Ignatius sets up bishop, bishops, scholars tell us, in order to centralize control over the house churches. The Eucharist, then, taking communion, is only valid under the bishop. So the, the, the house church leaders cannot, it cannot give uh, the communion anymore. And the, that, then the bishops, there are no women. So women are marginalized and pushed aside as structure comes in, which is often the case with revivals. When revival breaks out and there's more work to be done, than, than we can possibly handle, and this God's Spirit is moving, women have, are very involved. But then, as things sort of settle down and get more structured, repeatedly we've seen uh, women fall to the sides and, and pushed, in many cases, to the sides, as historians will tell us. Um, from about 100 to 400 A.D., the early church leaders and bishops often speak against women. We can read this in, our, uh, in the literature. Though some exceptional women have great influence throughout the centuries. Uh, the council of, of uh, one of the particular councils refers to the ordina ordina ordination of deaconesses in the year 451. So we know there were deaconesses. There's, there's no word in the Greek for a deaconess. There's just deacon. It's diakonos. Then um, in, the, in the Middle Ages start, uh, about 400, and the medieval church sanctions wife beatings based on 1 Corinthians 11.3, the man is head. It's an unfortunate part of our history, isn't it? The esteemed, highly esteemed historian Will Durant says, and I quote, men were exhorted from the pulpit to beat their wives 
and wives to kiss the rod that beat them. Well, that's just sick, isn't it? In 533, the Synod of Orleans abolishes the office of deaconess due to, quote, the weakness of the female sex. A few years later, the Council of Macon debates whether women have souls, and some accounts tell us it passes by one vote. In the year 1200, France has a law allowing wife beating, an actual law that was on the books. In 1212, a woman named Claire establishes the, what's called the Poor Clares, which is now still in 76 countries, and I went on their website just the other day. In the year 1312, the Council of Vienne restricts women from partaking of communion while pregnant or menstruating. In 1370, one of these exceptional women uh, rises up, Catherine of Siena, and she advises the most powerful political leaders of the time, including the, per the Pope. And uh, history accounts tells us at times corrected him, too, and called him. Uh, to a, a more godly way in some things. We see in the 1400s a very dark period in our history when at least 40,000 women and 10,000 or so men, and these we're told are conservative figures, were burned at the stake as witches, some women even for translating the Bible, for example, the Beguines. A hundred years later, in 1750, Jonathan Edwards and Charles Finney allow women to pray and testify publicly in mixed gatherings. This was very controversial. And John Wesley even allowed women to preach publicly. 1840, a woman named Phoebe Palmer was pivotal in the holiness movement. And she encouraged after God dealt with her repeatedly, and she tells her very poignant story. She encourages women to obey the call to public ministry. A few years later, the Free Methodist Church was founded and ordained women. 1875, Catherine Booth co-founded the Salvation Army with her husband. She preaches. Women were ordained. And her husband says, some of my best men are women. <laughs> In 1900, 67% of the missionaries from the U.S. to other countries are women. Many are going because they have no place in the church at home. Uh, in about 1920, one of these women who had done amazing things on the field came back to her denomination, and she was not allowed to tell the story to the group of pastors who had gathered in leadership. One of these pastors was so upset by this, a man named A.J. Gordon, who has, uh, is known for other things as well and some of his contributions personally, decided to study the scriptures about women, and he found some of the things that I'll be talking to you about here. Another woman, Dr. Catherine Bushnell, a brilliant woman, studied Greek and Hebrew so, so she could study the scriptures about women. She said, God, if you're calling me, as she felt he had been, you need to show me in the scripture. And she learned these languages in order to do it, and her book is fabulous. She's a pithy writer, Catherine Bushnell, God's Word to Women. And uh, she did some great uh, things herself and contributed uh, to the history of, our, of, of uh, freeing women from oppression, from prostitution at the time in the early 1900s. In 1920, the U.S. gave women the right to vote. And do you know how this battle for the vote started? It was a, a result of a 70-year battle led by Christian women, many of whom were Quakers, who they, their histories tell us cried out to God, how can we stop so much alcoholism? How can we save our homes from this alcoholism? And one, one woman tells the story of God put it in her heart to fight for the vote. If women could get the vote, they could help change society. In 1940, uh, 1940s to 1950s, a woman named Henrietta Mears mentors Billy Graham and Bill Bright who had such, have had such an amazing impact on all of us. And they both publicly give her credit. She started Forest Home. She started Gospel Light Publishing. She was an amazing, exceptional woman, a, a role model and inspiration for us all, male and female. Then feminism emerges. Some of it, shall we say much of it, harsh toward men, coming out in the wrong spirit, fighting maybe some battles that needed to be fought where women would not be divorced by their husbands and left with children with virtually nothing, where single women 
uh, couldn't earn a decent wage in the marketplace. There were some, some good battles, but the spirit in which some of it was done, instead of embracing men and women to work together, was harsh and offended many people. Uh, many denominations at that time were offended. And um, at that time, more study rolled out. More scholars on both sides of the issues, Bible scholars, began to look at the scriptures about women and see what they had to say. Interestingly, different denominations came out on different sides of the issue. People of good faith, well-educated on both sides, and came out on different opinions on whether women should be in leadership in ministry. That kicked off two decades of study, and we're going to we're going to look at the up-to-the-minute research that's come forth. Good scientists stay open-minded, right? Good scientists say, okay, what's the latest double-blind study here that shows us the results? Oh, okay, we found this out. Let's incorporate that into our thinking. Is God doing that with us today? I'll leave that for you to decide. In 1999, Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho, who has the largest church in the world, over a million people in, in, located in Korea, <clears throat> said that out of 50,000 cell group leaders, the small groups that meet um, individually, 47,000 of the leaders are women. I think his mother or his mother-in-law had quite an influence as a godly woman on him and was a role model. So he said, hey, I have no problem with letting women be in leadership. Doesn't mean the man can't be, but he sure released them, didn't he? 2001, uh, we're told uh, by those in the know that an estimated one-half to two-thirds of church planners in, women, in China are women and young women aged 18 to 24. Some come to the U.S. and say, what's going on here? You mean women are held back? But God is using them there in China. In 2004, the Lausanne Conference was held, and the Lausanne Committee said, we've experienced, uh, they said, and I quote, we call on the church around the world to work towards full partnership of men and women in the work of world evangelization by maximizing the gifts of all. So much is at stake here. It's the kingdom and sharing the kingdom. So we really do need to take the time to take a look and study the scriptures.